What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. Welcome back, Nightmare Success In and Out listeners. I have a great guest today. Um, you know, and I love these type of guests where I get referrals from great guests. I mean, I can't imagine Marvin Cotton Jr. and Philip Sample being in the same room just talking shop, but these guys are out doing stuff in the community and making th- stuff happen. And so when Marvin gave me Philip's name, he was telling me a little bit about him. And, and, uh, so I went and, and started checking it out. What uh, Marvin told me, man, Philip is it, just, I'm going to just read in a little bit about his story just because it's such a fascinating transformation. But uh, Philip Sample was born uh, in impoverished Detroit, Michigan. He was raised between the slums of Detroit, Michigan and the gang ridden south side of Chicago, Illinois. As a result of a dysfunctional, unstable housing, ill education, violence, Philip became a product of this environment. He joined a gang at 11 years old, became a leader of his own gang by the time he was 14. Philip got caught up, got felonies when he was in juvenile, but at 18 years old, he had uh, been he was convicted of three counts of assault uh, with an intent to commit murder at the age of 18 years old for anywhere from 12 to 20 years he was looking at while he was in prison uh he it just was a complete um self-evaluation self-transformation and he was released after 15 years in prison philip hit the ground running and he returned back to his old neighborhood and he wanted to make amends for his past actions and contribute to rebuilding that community. And he uh, is currently the owner of The Passion of the Life uh, LLC. He's the author of the book, The Passion of the Life, The Life, uh, uh, let's see, what is it? The Life, Death, and Resurrection of Philip Sample. He um, just, a, and he, he founded, established uh, Responsible Able Hands and Minds of Detroit. And what I just want to read real quick what it does, because it's just it's uh, everything that we think we want. And he's putting it in and injecting it into the community. Um, it's phase three of a three year plan to build uh, a space, a place uh, where the community can uh, learn, a place to inspire the senses, an alternative to incarceration for our youth, a place for resources and opportunity, as well as clearing lots, beautifying lots, establishing gardens and areas of recreation and entertainment and culture. They'll be teaching the youth enduring skills in all different types of fields. And uh, this uh, will uh, continue the process of strengthening the family and community and, and strengthen the bonds in t- inside the community. Unbelievable stuff, and uh, he's got a documentary documentary that he's working on too. So he's just a busy, busy man. I really appreciate Philip, you taking the time here today to get your voice out and uh, and your story because I think it's something that uh, is inspiring, and that's what people need. You know, to hear that hey, it's not it's not the end. It's it's it can be a new beginning, and you you completely transformed. So, Philip, man, welcome in. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. So, Philip, you know, I just touched on it a little bit, but growing up where you grew up, um, in such a tough environment as a kid, can you bring me back, kind of walk us through your life as a kid when you were in, you know, your family, uh, brothers, sisters, what was life like? So I, I was definitely um, a, a happy child, irrespective of, of what was going on around me. Um, I call it my endeavor to fight down the beast. Yeah. Um, I grew up in, in 
and you know, Chicago, Detroit, back and forth all my young life between gangism and drugs and alcoholism and domestic violence and just, you know, all the stuff that we deal with in our communities due to idle hands, dysfunction, and ill education. Um, was your, I, wasn't, I was curious, like, with your home life, your direct home life, mom, so, dad? Uh, Mom, mom, single mom. Okay. My father was an older married man with children. My mother was a young girl. Um, yeah. He chose family, which which makes sense, I guess. Yeah. I think. <laughs> um, Any relationship that, with him, Philip? Absolutely. Um, only I wouldn't probably know him if he walked past, unless I got hit with a, you know, some energy or something, you know. <laughs> um, but no, no relationship with him at all. Yeah. You know, I actually found him. Um, not too long ago, you know, and, um, you know, I was, I was intent on reaching out, but I changed my mind. Um, yeah. you know, today I'm driven by firm morals and principles and, and, and I believe a lot of the problems that I faced and went through and a lot of the problems in the community is due to a lack of father. So yeah, I don't respect that. So, you know, I chose, you know, to be just, you know, I'm God's son, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and your brothers and brothers and sisters. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a um, younger sister and a younger brother. We um, have different fathers. My brother's father mm-hmm. was murdered when he was a baby. Um, I became father-like at ten years old. Um, my sister, father, he's still around. You know, um, good, positive um, person, definitely in my life. You know. Um, cool dude, you know, um, but a whole bunch of step, that's what, you know, uh, in and out type of dudes yeah. looking for whatever they were looking for and never, you know, formed a relationship with any of them, never really respected any of them. In mm-hmm. fact, I always said I would never be that guy, you know. Um, <clears throat> so you almost thought like, of it as doing the opposite of what they were doing. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, life in a garbage bag with, with a woman can tell you to go come you know, as she pleases, um, yeah. never respected them. Um, yeah. So when you, when, when things, you know, obviously in that neighborhood, you, what you were seeing as a kid, uh, was probably a little bit normalized. Was it, was, did you fear the streets or did it feel like that there was something because you were kind of born into that, that world that it felt normal to you? So I definitely did fear the street. I got 19, aunties and four uncles and <clears throat> we were a tribe man hundreds of thousands of cousins yeah from in detroit and chicago and we took care of each other so i didn't fear the streets i mean you know i've been in a house where the house was shot up of course that's a scary moment yeah but but um you know um how old would you have been when how would you have been philip when that happened were you oh the first time maybe <laughs> maybe like um 10, mm. 11, you know, um, but but violence nonetheless from as far as I can remember back, you know, to the point where I was desensitized to it very young. Because I, I was, one of my favorite movies is Boys in the Hood. And mm-hmm. like, how real is that to, you know, you see the kids walk in, you know, Ricky's got his football. They go to see the dead body and the bigger kids come and, you know, the one guy takes his football and the other guy's, like, you know, even though they're tough guys, he's like, man, we shouldn't take that guy's ball. I mean, did did you have kind of like mentor type people that you looked up to in that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My, my uncles, my uncles were street people. Yeah. Um, my cousins, older cousins were street people. Um, and, you know, as to that part of that movie, that's just the way that we love on one another, you yeah. know? Um you know, it's, it's hard. You know, it's 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 like it's lion like, it's like pride like, right? Yeah. Um. So you know, in in my opinion, you know, it's a thin line between bullying and preparation. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's a good statement, isn't it? Because you got to be strong enough to be in that world. You can't be soft. But you got into it really early. I mean, you know, I was reading your bio. You you know, at eleven years old, you're in the gang life. 14 years old, yeah, you're well, a leader in the gang life. Well, I was around gangism like forever. Yeah. And even when I, you know, made a decision, you know, to 
embrace that lifestyle, I was still never like into gang violence. Yeah. Like that didn't come until much later. Like I tell people, even in my Chicago days, you know, I would be 12 years old and I would catch the bus, the L, you know, from 94th Street to 51st or and walk all the way, you know, through the mm-hmm. projects at the time and go to school. And I never had you know, um, those type of issues. People knew what I represented, you know, my family represented, so I had a little love and respect on both sides. So I, I didn't I didn't really, you know, participate in gang violence when I was in Chicago. That's a funny thing. Yeah. So when you got into, so we're, uh, I, get, I was going to ask you that. So school-wise, um, did you have a group of guys, friends that you, you went to school with and, and was life, uh, you know, was school school? I mean, was, did you go to school? And so, so was school was, was not school. Yeah. Um, fast forward to eighth grade, 1989-ish. Yeah. School was the battle zone, man. School yeah. was, uh, you know, um, like I talk about in my book, it was a division. If you live six mile away, you went one way. If you live seven mile away, you went another way. And God forbid you get caught the wrong way on the wrong day. Mm. Um, so school, school became something else. You know, it's hard to listen when, when, when the guy sitting next to you, you got a hot one in his pocket and can go off at any point, you know. Um, so school definitely became something else. Um, I, I was intelligent nonetheless. Um, but, but I just, I just lost it, man. Like, like you're talking about the past and history and, and, and the beautiful things that Dr. King did, but I'm living in poverty and mm-hmm. violence and confusion like right now, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when your nightmare happened, the big one, when that all came down on that street corner, can you kind of walk through that whole you know, that, that's, I can't get a whole lot out of how that, how, how that could have all felt and when it happened and how it happened. So just to give you some context, we take to gangism in part due to a lack of not having identity, a purpose, a place. So when, when gangism offers this in a, an obsession or what I would like to call a fatal attraction to Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I became married to that thing. Um, my claim to fame was to take care of my neighborhood, look after the people there, look after the lady next door. And, and in return, in my neighborhood, I'm loved. I'm, 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 I'm celebrated. Um, so on that day, I had already been locked up on a prior gun case. And I was in the halfway house and I was allowed to go home for a weekend. Right. It's like the furlough. Yeah, you had a pass. Um, So, again, you know, the community, oh, you know, the homeboy, big homie home or whatnot. So it was was a party. It was a celebration. And I guess what we call the ops saw that as an opportunity to what we would call slide nowadays, right? Um, So, you know, they came through one time and, you know, and, and, you know, just street rules of engagement, that's not something that they do. We don't ride down their block. They don't ride down our block unless it's an ill and sin. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we kind of like, oh, wow, what was that? Um, prepared accordingly. Um, had they shot or did what they was going to do at that first pass, they might have got down because we was not ready at all. But, you know, we prepared. So, unfortunately, they came back, right back. Um and it went down, man. Um, gunfire erupted. Um, I found out, so I, I ran, jumped in the car with my friend. We went to my wife, who is my wife now. We went to her house, and um, my pager was blowing up. Nine one one. Um, I called the, the block back. You know, we had a payphone on the block that we would call back, and basically. You know, that's when I found out that that a baby had been shot in the in the crossfire of, of the shootout or whatever, or or a bullet ricocheted off the, you know, some type of way a baby had been shot in the crossfire. So, you know, I fell back on the porch like, oh, what? No way, you know, like um. So I told my homeboy like, take me back to the block. 
be like, hell no, like that would make no sense. Like I'm gonna take you to your mama. <laughs> um, so I went home. Um, couldn't sleep, of course, just trying to figure out. Like you know, I didn't see you know the streets were clear, but the baby and, and, and his mother was actually in the store. Um, just just going through it in my head, like you know, like what on earth. How you know what what what's next? Like uh, the next morning, one of my homeboys had told on me. Um, uh, so the police called me, basically like you know who this is. I was like, yeah, and he was like, um, where you at? I'm like, um, you know, given that you got the number, you, I'm assuming you know where I'm at, and they did, and they came and got me. And I was charged with one count of first degree murder for the child and two counts of assault with intent to commit murder. Um, three counts of assault with intent to commit murder. Went to trial. So so let me give you some, some deep psychological stuff right here, right? Yeah. I was willing to take a plea for more time if they would have dropped the murder charge on the baby, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I didn't want to go to jail with that. I mm -hmm. didn't care if that meant me doing 30 years for assault with intent to commit murder. I can accept that. Right. But I couldn't go to prison with that on me. They didn't um, buy that, so I went to trial. Um, I get that. Yeah. All during trial, brother, it was 27 witnesses against me. Um, one witness for me, uh, bless her heart, and I kind of felt like all the sacrifices that I had made, you know, I devoted my life, my freedom, my safety. I fed these people. Mm -hmm. And to have nobody in support of, that was like just demoralizing, bro. And then again, some of my own people testified on me. So, you know, I, I was in a bad way, man. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a prayer. I pray. I've been a prayer my whole life. Um, I, I feel even at my lowest of lows, I never lost sight of what God means to me or, or, or has the power to do. So at one point in the trial, you know, I got on my knees, man. I was in the bullpen. I got on my knees and said, you know, you know, my heart, you know, yada, yada, yada. So this, that, the other. So I go back out into the courtroom. You know, uh, the next very next person that took the stand was the owner of the store. And basically, in his testimony, he said that it was damaged to both sides of the store. Oh, uh, bro, that was like the light came on in the room. Um, mm -hmm. The next person took the stand basically said that it was the ballistic specimens, um, that shell casings one through whatever it was, definitely came from the weapon I was firing, but this number, that number, and that number came from a different weapon. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you know anything about law that created what we call a shadow of, of doubt, right? Um, got found not guilty um, of the murder of the baby, um, but profoundly guilty in my own conscience, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and I carry it with me to this very day, man. It's, it's uh, when I think about it, when I tell the story, it's that pointing it now as it was that day, you know, like 30 years later. You know yeah, I, mean? I can hear the emotion in your voice when you tell this story. It's, yeah. And it yeah. had to have been, what did you, what were you feeling when it came back and they said you weren't guilty? I mean, that had to have been like, you know. Uh, it, it was, it was, it was, Relieving, but at the same time, not so much so, mm -hmm. um, because again, you know, that didn't bring the child back. Right. Right. You know, my first two years in prison was how to kill myself without it hurting so bad. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like like life calls for life. You know, uh, you can't say my bad. You know what I'm talking about? Um, right. That was where my thinking was. Um, at some point, you know, that's how the book happened. I was, you know, I'm like, how did I get here? Like, I'm trapped in the most 
you know, effed up situation I would have never saw coming, right? So I started thinking about life and just, you know, everything that, that got me up to that point. I just, you know, started writing stuff down. But, you know, at, at some point I got possessed to want to live, man, to like, you know, to, to, you know, to jump off the cliff for the toilet or whatever, that'd be like the most cowardice thing I could have done. Um, yeah. You know, isn't that, isn't that interesting though, Philip, how that happens, you know, cause you're all, I think, I don't know how many people ever get to that point where they get into a really, really dark place and they think that's an alternative. And, you know, when that strikes you that, oh my God, that's the most cowardly thing in the world. That's almost like where it reignites everything. That's the good part of you to figure out, okay, how do I climb out of this? You know, what, yeah. what is it? What is it I need to do to find my passion again? And it sounds like that you, once that hits you almost like at a rock bottom, you, you found your way, you know, there's, I guess there's, you know, there's two ways we always talk about, you know, whether somebody's a victim or a survivor, victim points, fingers and blames and whatever a survivor just says, I got it. It's mine, but I'm going to, I'm going to walk. It somehow gives you strength to will yourself into whatever that is you got to step into. And it sounds like at some moment in the, time period you just something happened through your self-evaluation that you felt some kind of transformation did you did you write it all before that had ever happened no it, it, it um it, it took it was a process yeah. you know uh, i wrote i wrote the book my entire 15 years and i'm still writing on the book um there's two more parts yeah you know, i saw but, it says part one on the on the book you yeah. wrote yeah <laughs> you're not so, done you know, so, so, you know, the book was, the book saved me, man, yeah. period. Yeah. It was a vent, but, but even more than that, it was like, you know, so, so my first study, you know, I studied everything under the sun. One of my first studies was psychology. I wanted to know, you know, why when I get angry, it, it's so extreme. Mm -hmm. Like why, you know, like what, what, where does this, this, these, these triggers come from, right? So I start like one of, you know, again, I caught my case in, in my perspective in defense of the block, right? Watching my mother fight grown men, you know, being the brunt of the bully, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it instilled in me this want to be like, um, you know, I'm the bully's bully type of mentality, yeah. right? Yeah. So I felt like even though my methods were ugly, I kind of felt like it was coming from a pure place, right? Right. But, but I wanted to understand that. I wanted to process all of that, right? So I started getting into the psychology, how the mind works, then sociology, right? How does, how the mind works correspond with how society works, right? Yeah. And, um, and I began to see myself, man. Um, and, and, and in that scene, I began to be able to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely responsible for my own actions, but realizing that some other stuff affected me. Right. Um, not knowing how to process these things, you know, um, made me, you know, I never like consider myself to be a bad person. It just made me other than the person I feel my mother went through 19 hours of hard labor to bring to the world. Right. Yeah. No, that's deep. And, and you, you started getting deep into that and basically finding yourself through all that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. while you were, while you were doing that, you're in prison and, yes. and you're in prison for a while, you know, I mean, you're not just in prison for a couple of years, you're in prison to where this is going to be your life for a while. Did you, did you have any particular things Philip, that you did that, I mean, obviously writing and studying this and, and getting more understanding of who you were and why you did what you did and how you acted to certain things and, and getting an understanding of all that. Do you think that was kind of a, an escape for you while you were in prison to open your mind and get all that new knowledge that kept you... I don't know what would that be called. Almost inspired of the mind. Uh definitely. Um, 
every day would look the same. If you didn't learn something new, then every day was the same. So I got obsessed with knowledge. I learned from every religion, every gang, every person. And, and um, about four years in, I joined the Nation of Islam. Um, I became the minister of the Nation of Islam for the rest of my being. Um, and that just took everything that I thought I was to a whole nother level. Um, just, just, and you know, and when I practice something, I do it wholeheartedly. When I gang banged, I gang banged hard. Mm. When, 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 when I was pushing what we call the program, you know, I pushed the program hard. You know, I prayed when I was supposed to pray. I ate the way I was supposed to eat. I fasted the way I was supposed to fast, and therefore I reap the ultimate benefit of that. So, you know, nobody can tell me whether it works mm -hmm. or don't work because I'm clear evidence that it works mm -hmm. if, if you let it. Um, in the Nation of Islam, I use that platform to, you know, uh, maintain truces on the yard with gangs, with religions. Um, sometimes it didn't work out as, as peaceful as we planned. Um, I did three years in the Max with too much influence. Um, I think no. it's always interesting how that happens, though, in the prison world, because people don't understand that if you get too much what the BOP or the prison believes is uh, too much leverage, too much authority, too much influence, they don't like that. They pull you out. So, you know, and, and, and you know, so I had to file a lawsuit to get out of segregation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what the judge said was, you're not in segregation because of what you did, but you're there because of what you have the potential to do. Mm -hmm. He who can stop a riot can start a riot. Right. So kind of just woke me up. You know, prior to that, you know, you couldn't touch me on the yard unless I, you know, not in permission. Um, I moved with a mob, and, and they were very serious mob. Um, I came out of there like, you know what? I got to be quiet. I got to find a different way to move. Mm -hmm. And I got to maneuver my way up out of here, you know, and, and I did that. Um, it's interesting, though, Philip, because everything about prison is adapting because you're in an environment, a primitive environment, and you pivoted and adapted again. I mean, you adapted the first go in one way and you pivoted again while you were still in prison and adapted and, and another way. You know, and the funny thing about that is I, I had big homies who had been down and they used to be like, man, you got to get involved. You got too much time. Yeah. And I, I don't care about this. I don't care about that. And then I looked up a few years later and it's all I cared about. Yeah. Um, I have, a, I have a theory that, that I call, you have to come on in. Like I believe if you got a year, Two years, you maybe can, you know, stay in this place where you're here, but your mind is yeah. free, if you, right? right? So I think when you had the type of time that I had, you got to come on in. I had to stop worrying about what this old girlfriend was doing. You know, that yeah. stuff. Was yeah. Or it'll you bring know, you she, down. She's sleeping with the ops and, 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 and pregnant with the enemy. And, you know, so I'm like, you know, I got to let the world go what the world is going to do and I got to focus on me. You know what I mean? So, um, and again, just, just studying, working out, bro, you know, and just, just, you know, preparing for the role that whenever I do come home, I'll be ready. Like I was politicized. You know, I started doing poetry with PCAP in the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so it's not like you had forgotten about the outside because everything that you were doing, Philip, was really preparing yourself to to step out and and engage the outside. Because I think that's one of the interesting things about your story is there's a lot of people. Well, it, I I mean I know people that have been in for two three years and and they they never they never rebound. It's just it, it's one of those things that always and will ever be the thing that they use as the crutch that they can't get back into society. I thought the interesting thing about your story is, is that um, you, you used your time to transform yourself, self-evaluate, make the best parts of you bigger. And when you stepped back into society, you started doing, you know, big things. I mean, the things that, 
I always say that there's so many things out in our society. One of the things I think that, you know, we, we look at right now because our society is so messed up is we don't communicate anymore. You know, it's one side over here, one side over there, and they never hear each other. And I think, one of the things, uh, you know, whether it's Marvin Cotton Jr. or Daryl Woods Sr. or, or you, uh, when I ever talk to you guys, it's, it's interesting how you're always looking to bring it together. Always figure out a way that everybody can be stronger, bonded together. And that's the thing overall society's missing now. And I'm, I'm not just talking about Detroit. I'm just talking about anywhere. I mean, politics in general, you know, you've got the left and the right and they, they, they're at enemy w- wards. And so, I think, you know, your voice is so powerful because of what you went through, how you went through it, how you survived, and then how you came out. Because a lot of times you can have those elements, but how you come out of that, that's the end of the story. And you ended up carrying out. So when you got closer, because you were in for so, what did it feel like to you to be getting closer to the door after that amount of time? Uh, it, was, it was it was terrifying, man. It was it was scary. It was um, you know, but not you know. So so fear induced this fight, yeah, flight, freeze, yeah. right? It was it was definitely not a flight nor freeze. You know, I was I was it was terrified, but I was ready to fight the good fight. You know, um, I believed in my mind. I believed in my willpower. Uh, you know, I, I hadn't. I have no bad relationships. Even the beef that I did have, you know, we we end up, you know, growing up and, and, and a lot of us falling in love with one another. You know, yeah. after blood shed, you know, after loss on both sides, right? right? You know, and that's that's how I'm able to tell the youth today that it's doable because I've done it. You know what I mean? Um, You've but it. but it was scary, man. It, you know, it was scary, but you know, I, I felt like. You know, we used to call it back to where we belong. You know, I knew I would go home one day. Yeah. You know, um, I, I believed I deserved to go home. I believe I had something to contribute to the society. You know what I mean? What was it like getting out that day, Philip? I mean, after all that time, I mean, you walk out. What is? What's the feelings you're feeling? What? Do you, what walk me through that. Um, so I caught the Greyhound from Jackson, Michigan to downtown Detroit. Yeah. My sister uh, picked me up. You know, I had on the Browns that they give you, and I'm in my Foot Locker. Yeah. And and, and, and a whole bunch of paperwork and plans, man. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I got to the house. I paroled to stay with my uncle. Um, we do music. He had a studio. Perfect um, environment. Um, he gave me a pair of pants. I didn't have a belt. I'm walking around holding the pants up. <laughs> But, but you know, I was happy, man. I didn't, uh, I didn't think about tomorrow or, or what. You know, it'll get serious in a minute. That's how I felt. Like let's just absorb. Yeah. Uh, family pulling up, friends pulling up. Let's just take it all in, and mm-hmm. tomorrow it, it'll be serious enough. You know, um, and and just went like you know, I was humble, man. What I tell guys is, you know, everything that was offered to me, I took. Whether it was a ten dollar voucher for ID. A fifty dollar voucher for work clothes, whatever it was, I took it. Um, I got a job with Habitat for Humanity when they said I couldn't. Mm-hmm. You know, I pressed. I talked to people. Uh, I maneuvered. I, I was building houses and rehabbing homes in my old neighborhood. Uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to paint over that because I think that's a big thing you just hit on, Philip. Is um, so many people use the excuse that they can't get back into the world because they're an ex felon, you know, that I, you know, I've got this for, you know, I've got a tattooed on my forehead. I'm an ex felon and they can discriminate against me when I go for a job or where I won't go. But you have to work twice as hard to get that. And, you know, if you really want it, they got to see your passion that I'm that guy. I'm not this guy. And you did that. And, that had to have made you feel like you were making progress in something that a lot of people just weren't doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and again, I was just that humility piece, man. Um, you know, I'm not going to do this. Or I'm not going to do that. Like we had these high expectations, but we don't talk about what we're going to put in to reach those, uh, that level of benefit. Right. Um, 
So I came out ready to pay my dues, man. I knew for a fact that I owed society, mm -hmm. but I also felt like society owed me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, 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 if I'm a son of, of the community and, and, you know, and I return, you know, will you help me be successful or just leave me and thereby I becoming what I was, right? If that makes sense. Um, so I believe reentry is, 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 is society's uh, responsibility um, yeah. or not and, and see what happens, right? So, so, you know, I came out like I'm coming to give what I owe and I'm definitely coming to get what's owed to me, even if that's the job, even if that's decent living, even if that's, um, you know, whatever it may be, you know, so, so, and then, you know, I feel like if I was coming to make excuses, I should have never came out. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And people don't really like that anyway. You know, it's like in prison, people don't like whiners. They don't like people who... I can't believe yeah. I'm here. I, I didn't do this or I, I all that. that. You want somebody just to kind of go over to the other side, get, o get over that and come back when you're done because right. it's not going to change. You got to get used to it and, and live in it. Uh, oh, it <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but Philip, when did you start realizing once you got your feet under you, what, like what was the biggest change for you? Like since you'd been in, cause I'm trying to think you got out in 2009 yeah. So the 90, whole it's like smartphone and technology uh, and all that, that had to be weird, wasn't it? Uh, it was so weird. I spent a few days sitting in the corner with the phone. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, within a year, I was recording and mixing my own music. I was doing graphic designs, making my own flyers. Um, so you picked it up fast. Oh, uh, yeah. I would sit there and, and just go and click and unclick and, 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 until I figured it out. You know, um, I knew that the technology was a big part of the way the world worked, yeah. but, but it also made a lot of stuff easy. You know, I published my own book. Yeah. I turned down a quarter million dollars a book offer because um, I didn't want to sell the rights to my story 100%. Uh -huh. um, I don't regret that decision. I was called crazy, blind, deaf, and dumb. <laughs> um, but I don't regret that. Um, you know, yeah, I published my own book. Like, where could you go and open up a template and all you got to do is copy and paste and, and the book is done or, or, you know, push a button and you live to the whole world. Like, like the capacity of technology was mind blowing, you know? Yeah. You know, in my time, we, you know, if you had what, what they call followers or, or you, you had a name, you earned, you earned it the iron way, you know, it wasn't no, uh, <laughs> likes and hearts and, and uh, <laughs> You had to, you had to really, really get out there and get it, man. So, but I, I'm like, you know, I'm about to, I'm about to run the muck, man. I got probably 25 music videos. Uh, well, tell me a little bit about that. How did you, how did you get into all that? Because, you know, I, I've been into music since I was like eight years so old. So it was kind of in the family. Was it oh, yeah. uncles and DJ? Yeah, you know, he, uh, he saved me, man. He yeah. moved in with hip hop and techno. Yeah, and, and I. Michael Jackson crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He saved me. But, um, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I love music. I've always been, in, you know, into music. Uh, so I came home again. He had the studio. Yeah. One of my homeboys, he gifted me a video. Yeah. And I'm like, man, you know, I'm thinking a person going to pull up with this little camera. You know, shout out to my man, Aunt Cherry. Shout out to my man, Boudet, right? <laughs> uh, big old cameras and stuff, man. A lot of people, and it was amazing. And then he texts me and say, get on channel, uh, I think it was 38 at the time, and the video was on TV, right? Wow. So I'm like, you know what I mean? Um, wow. It is not that I ever, you know, came out with the thought, I want to be a rapper, I'm going to be a rapper. I actually think. That time was sacrificed during my incarceration, but it is something I love to do, and um, it's available to me to do it. So I'm yeah, doing. Got to do it, man. Follow your passion. Yeah. Well, yeah. what what made you? Because I obviously you you kind of found your way and your and your thinking in prison. Uh, when you got out, Philip, were you thinking I'm going to go and I'm going to do some things? in my community, the community I know, and I'm going to start affecting change. How did that come about? Because you, I mean, you established and founded 
organizations um, that begin doing some incredible things for the community. Did you did you have that confidence right away, or did you kind of f- feel your way around and think, okay, no, I need to do this. I'm the one that w- wants to do this. I definitely didn't have that confidence. So the nonprofit game and the corporate game and the credit game, that's not something that we are taught where I come from. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, so I was sitting, so I was writing inside for an um, organization called PCAP, Prison of Creative Arts Project. Mm-hmm. Uh, rest in heaven to my man, Buzz Alexander, who was an angel to me, man. I would go to Ann Arbor, recite poetry, go to different panels, you know, traveling with him. And through him, I met a brother from Albuquerque, New Mexico, named Albino Garcia. Shout out to my mentor, my main man, OG. He flew back to New York. I, I got on the board of the Circle for Justice Innovation. Yeah. And what we did on that board, so it's people with money and people who've been there and done that. They come together, basically, put the money on the table. We raise more money and we say, you know, people write grants and we go over the grants and look. And I'm learning this thing from the other side. I'm looking at what the funders are looking for. I'm looking like how it needs to be structured. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I went to Albuquerque. I I saw my man, uh, La Placita. Blew my mind, right? I'm like, oh my goodness, you know. Um, and I started asking questions, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, he answered, you know, gave me some things to do, and I came home and I did them. You know, 2017, you know, Raham was born. You know, um, if you're able to respond, you're responsible. So that's where it comes from. Um, and, you know, the first three years was hard. Um, Anything that got done or halfway done came out of my pocket and I didn't even have pockets. Uh-huh. You know, I've been homeless twice since I've been home. Um, it ain't been no crystal stair, brother. Um, <laughs> and it no, never bro. is. You know, that's the thing. Uh, and I think one of the things that you said there is so important, especially for the youth to understand that if you see somebody doing something that you want to do, but you don't know how to do it, humbling yourself and just asking them, hey, man, how's that work? It's like getting the answers to the test before the test because a lot of these people who will mentor you, they're willing to tell you uh, because they're, 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 they're happy that they're doing what they're doing and they're doing it well. And you went out, you, you got all around the right people and, and got the right mentors to be able to get the answers that you needed to do what you were wanting to do. Yeah. And, and I listened, man. He he was great. He introduced me to uh, my man, George Galvis in Oakland. I went out there, looked at what he was doing, learned from him. And, you know, I got these guys on tap. I could reach out and say, sure. I'm stuck with it. I'm stuck. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm in my own office. We got three offices right here, open space. Um You know, we've been, we've been doing it, man. Well, I, look, part I don't want to. And, and, Philip, I don't yeah. want to cross over what you said about the homeless thing because um, I've got a good friend of mine that that was homeless twice, and he's out in L.A. now and has his own production company, um, and he survived that. How did how did you get through that? Oh man, you know, so you know, I I, I took it in stride, man. Like you know, I wasn't worried about it. Um, you know, one of the ways I became homeless is because. Um, I had finally was able to secure a lease. You know, I didn't want to keep living with my woman's name on everything. Talking about <laughs> I'm the king of the castle. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's part of it. You know, and I finally had found uh, an apartment that would, you know, give me a lease. And what happened with that was um, when when the property management or whatever switched over, they came with that criteria: we don't lease the felons. So it was immediate eviction. Um, my my baby boy was in the womb. You know, that's my sister. She opened her house. You know, um, you know. But but you know, and I, I took it in stride, man. I knew it was the moment. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't allow it to uh, make me desperate. I'm about to go rob the world and kick in a hundred doors, right? Um, mm-hmm. No, you know, um, hold your stomach and rock out to the morning. What is this trying to tell me, right? Mm-hmm. So. I'll be very passionate about 
um, equal and fair housing for formerly incarcerated people. You know, when you go through some trauma, mm-hmm. it's from whence your purpose comes, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. So, uh, I've been working with Ceasefire in Detroit for the last two, three years, and, and though it's stressful and, and severely, um, a dream come true, man, where, you know, I'm working with young gang involved youth, you know, and nobody understands them better than me, man. Nobody get it like I get it. Nobody like can do my part of the job like I do it. And it's something I would do for free. Yeah. So so to be able to draw some some sustenance from that is like again a testament to faith. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure that fills you up though, because these guys are they're younger uh, I mean, obviously you can identify with what they're going through in their lives and, you know, being able to show them that there's a different path and being able to show them that the path that you've chosen now is filling you up and making you who you are and, and you're doing so many good things. You know, so many times I think, Philip, the, the, the younger people, if, if given a fork in the road, they'll look at both options. It's just that so many times there's not that fork to look at both options. They're only seeing one path. And what yeah. you're, what you're doing is, is you're be, you're able to show them the path that they are on. And then the path that you lived and now you're able to use your experience of the path that you're living now. And, you know, God, that's, that's just, you know, that's so powerful for people who are looking for, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. Oh man. It's, 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 um, Sometimes it's, it's, it's like a dream, man. You know, I just left a press conference with the, with the mayor, man. You know, it's, it's like a dream, and he knows me, and, you know, and we shake hands, and, and he called me by name, right? Yeah. Um, just to be at these tables advocating for my people, man, um, to be able to say, you know, look at me as an example. Yeah. You know, they need incarceration. They need resources, right? So, you know, to have that capacity and, and, and the capacity to know when to change clothes and, and put my suit on and, and, yeah. and talk a level of language or, or to be able to write at another level of engagement, right, to, you know, to move funders and, 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 and get grants, right? It's just, um, again, it's favor, man, to just be able to, to well, think and, and move, brother. And I think you, what you're doing there, Philip, is is it, it when when – people go through the world of prison and, and you're able to get things out and do things on the right path, having that seat at the table and having the ability to leverage your past, to be the legitimate voice, the real voice at the table so that they listen to you. See, I think a lot of the things that happen, there's probably, you know, these round table discussions, but they don't have the right people at the table that can really affect the change. You know, an idea out here without the right voice is just an idea, but you put somebody at the table who's lived it and, and knows it and also wants to implement it. That's when real change happens because that action can be implemented. And, and that's when things happen. That's why I think what you're doing right now in the community has so much real purpose to it because you are who you are. You know, you're not just somebody that flew in and you're going to talk to them and fly out. You know it. You've lived it. You've lived the streets of it, and they know it. And that's that's yeah. whatever that vibe is. That's the real stuff. It's, 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 it, it has yet to be a youth or a group of men, young men or women, mm-hmm. that I haven't been able to reach. Yep. You know, yeah. I tell people, give me the worst of the worst, the ones that you think are, are the most, see, because, those are the most pained. Yeah. Right? Those are the ones that need, they, they are hugged away from a breakdown. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. The society, to, and, and I do get it, right? You're a menace. You're doing this, that, and the other, but why? You know what I mean? Like, why am I a menace to society? Right? I didn't, I wasn't a little baby and say, you know, look, Philip, when you grow, what you going to be? And I said, I'm going to be a menace to society. No, I used to say, <laughs> All right. Right? I'm going to be. At one point, I was going to be a police officer, right? Uh-huh. So, you know, it, it, it just don't happen that way, man. Um, but 
you know, nobody, you know, can do what I do better, man. Um, no, and, and I think the other thing that's so effective is, is that you can tell that, I mean, just you telling the story today, I feel your story of what you told, how you were in prison and you're like, why do I think this way? Like, I'm yeah. going to get into psychology. Why am I triggered like this? <laughs> I got a lot of, I got a lot of shit inside here that I haven't let loose and I haven't let go. But why? Do, and then you got deeper into it and you invested the time by you telling that story and, and relaying it to people and them saying, me too, I get it. Um, that's, you know, I, you know, looking through all the stuff that you've got going on, you've seen, because you talk about, you know, that, that neighborhood used to be kind of like Norman Rockwell, and then it, it fell back into the, one of the worst neighborhoods there is. That's not ever saying that it can't be what it needs to be or, or should be for the community okay. if, the, if the community comes together like they, they want to. It, it can and it will be. We, we're trying to buy everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, you're clearing and, lots, you're beautifying, yeah. you're, you're putting uh, things, uh, skills in. You know, I'm a social scientist, man. Mm -hmm. I was a young teenager, and I sat on a roof with an AK-47, and I devised a plan to what I call corner my neighborhood. And, and I understood that we needed to take away the street lights. I understood that, that we needed to monitor the traffic that came through here. So as a grown man from a pure place, I know how to turn it around. Yep. Um, this is not theory. Um, this, is, this is practice. You know, um, it's, it's a uh, my old neighborhood charm is a seven mile. It's a high opioid overdose prostitution, what you would call a red light district. I say simply put up some 5,000 lumens, motion light, yeah. and it'll go away. Yeah. yeah. You know, you don't have to lock nobody up. You don't got to huff and puff. You don't got to argue. You don't got to push and shove. Just turn the lights on. Turn the I'm lights saying, on. The first thing we did right here was turn the lights off. Turn the lights on. Yeah. You know, so how it, profound it, is that? You know, it, it's 22 new built homes over there. Mm -hmm. You know, they beautiful. We we uh, moving on the recreation piece now, mm -hmm. which I think is very important. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, to get a youth something to do, but but it's doable, man. Um, yeah, it's about it's just about you know who 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 gonna have the patience in the, in the well. And the I way. think I think one of the other things, and I hope. You know, these type of things that you're talking about, Philip, you know, you were talking about you reached out to mentors that were like in San Francisco and New Mexico and all around. You know, hopefully as this continues to grow, that these are things that just seep out and they become part of every community so that what works is duplicated to all the neighborhoods that need it so that it becomes something that it's a system and a process that everybody knows this is the way to affect change into a community and, and the things that you're doing with that are those things. Those are things that you could duplicate in St. Louis or you could duplicate in another area that needs it. Those are things that if they come together, you put an umbrella over the top, there's a lot that could happen because you're affecting it right there. It just, it just, it could be duplicated other places. I say it all the time. If we can do it in the 48205 zip code, which is considered one of the most dangerous places in the country, yeah. we can do it anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah it is, it's, it's just being blessed, man. You know, I got I'm married now, two children. Yeah, tell me know. about that. Tell me about your life with your kids and everything. What, what, how old are they? It's great. They drive me crazy, but it's <laughs> boy absolute. girls. Uh, a, a girl, too. Okay. And a boy, six. Okay. They uh they got their own company, Big Head Billionaires LLC, <laughs> um, and it's just great, man. That you know, people say you're a great dad, and I say you know, and 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 I thank my daddy for it, you know, um because I know what I know what I needed and wanted. Um, and you're filling you know? that up, yeah. So I thank him regardless to his absence. I love him, yeah. you know. And he would be a fool to not want to embrace a son like me. <laughs> no doubt. Well, Philip, what, I, I got to ask you this. Out of everything that, that you've gone through in your journey, and you've gone through a lot and you're affecting a lot, what, looking back at what you've gone through, what do you think your biggest takeaway for people listening to this about what they need to do or how you did, of how, you, how you've lived through your life? What do they need not to do? Not over till it's over. Yeah. 
when there's a will, there's a way. Yep. Um, get around the right people. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, and, and humble yourself, man. man. You know, that's it, man. Bottle that up. Bottle that up right there. <laughs> I love it. Every, can you repeat that? Yeah, humble yourself. Humble man. yourself. Right now, that, that's the biggest thing, you know. Um, but, but you know, and for me, it's even harder. Again, you know, I, I had just did 15 years where I was treated like prison royalty. Sure. So to have, you know, to come out to society and be normal, you know, it, 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 it you know, it takes some humbling. But I was always humble, you know. I never, you know, I never thought me worthy, bro. So it's always a, a constant striving to prove worthy. Like, you know, God, you've given me this capacity. You've given me this mind. You've given me this chance. Like, I just want to prove worthy, man. Um, you know, even with my job, bro, shout out to Siege Fire, bro. Shout out to my team. I got a team from, man, we got a team from, from heaven, man. Um, nothing like I ever seen before of selfless fearless people, bro, you know, that show up when the blood on the wall, when the baby been shot, you know, trying to comfort uh, siblings and mothers, man, you know, and, and, and uh, bro, we, we, it's just. It's, uh, it's, it's, powerful. it's powerful. It's powerful stuff. And I, I'll tell you the other thing I noticed in, in, in the common thread reading through all your different things and hearing your story today, you've always been a leader and, you yeah. know, leaders have a vision but they have to take action with their vision and they use their own experience to affect change by using that experience. And that's what you're doing. And, and, and you're doing it humbly, which, um, that's, I may be the secret sauce of all of it is, is you're staying grounded with it. You got your kids, you got your wife, you got everything that you got going and, and you're creating good. And man, Philip, I, I wish I could multiply you, and just, you know, have one of those machines and we could send out like 300 <laughs> Phillips. <laughs> we working on I'm, I'm giving it up. I'm not hoarding none of it. I'm giving it up, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Philip, man, yeah, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate the platform. I appreciate what you're doing for us. Um, shout out to my man, Marvin Cotton. Yes. For the opportunity. Um, Brother out here doing great work. Did not let the beast defeat him. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Um, and, and, and that's what it is, you know? Come on in. Have a seat. Yeah. We, yes, got, we got more people. We got more people for Philip seeing here. We better get off this podcast before he's got a room full. Philip. <laughs> Thank you, man, for being my guest today. For those out there, we were talking about books. I've got one, Nightmare Success, Loyalty, Betrayal, Life Behind Bars, Adapting, Finally Setting Yourself Free, a memoir. Um, and all those people who, who have uh, uh, Apple, Spotify, go to Apple, leave a review. Those really help out. Send people you get little bars at the top, share the show, get a notification. Love that. When I was in prison, I was always writing back to my people, Stay strong. I'll do the same. Man. Philip, you're a good man. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Good Send me that link to the book, man. I want to check it out. I will do so. Be good. All right. Have yes, sir.